Hi, I'm Mark Knight Cannon, and many of us have been really captivated by what we've seen among youth climate activists worldwide over the past year or so. Of course, Greta, we don't even need to use her last name any longer, made the cover of Time magazine as the person of the year. And here in Victoria, we've seen a lot of youth get very, very active. I have personally seen both of these young women in actions in just the past couple of weeks. I have Grace Sinatz with me and Hazel Henneberry. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. It's good to see you where we're not occupying a bank. Yeah, <laughs> that was definitely a tense situation to first meet someone, yeah. It was, but you know what was interesting? Um, a fellow from the Thai came in to interview yeah. you, and you stood up and you talked and you had so much presence. Where did you get that? I don't even know. Something in that room came over me and I kind of forgot that everybody else was there because I've done quite a few news interviews and I'd forgot that I was talking in front of like 30 people in the small opening lobby of a bank. And when it was over, everyone clapped and I was like, oh wait, I'm in front of people. Like I, people liked that? Like, yeah, that's I so weird. Have an audience. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how about you, Hazel? Um, do you find getting out front and being an organizer something that's really gratifying to you? And I, I know that I saw you the other night in a big organizing meeting here in Victoria. And the thing that struck me, I have to tell people this, is that you had the presence of somebody twice your age. You're 13, right? I am. Um, I find organizing just to be so empowering and it's really helped me be more eloquent and confident in my speaking and gives me this sense of community that I've never had as like a white atheist growing up, which is just wonderful. Why is that sense of community, in your opinion, so present in the youth movement? Is it because of the indigenous solidarity that's a big factor in that? I would, yeah, I would agree. Um, because from my experience being down at the legislature for quite a few days and nights is that there's just so much cultural presence that I've never experienced before. I can guarantee that I've learned more at my like very limited time um, with the indigenous youth standing in solidarity with them um, than I have in most of my life. Grace, have you had a similar uh, response? I definitely have, and to be perfectly honest, I was at the legislature for about five days on and off, only leaving for like midnight till 4 a.m. maybe. And when the camp packed down, it was like something was missing. Like, I felt kind of lonely, to be honest, with mm -hmm. eating, eating, sleeping, and breathing this place where like love and community is cherished and everyone is just so there for you and welcoming and there's no discrimination or prejudice anywhere. It's a pretty magical thing, and when the camp popped up, again, it honestly felt like going home. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? When we get involved with an organization or a movement, we're part of something that's much bigger than ourselves. There's a sense of, for lack of a better term, communion. Is that something that you're alluding to here? Yeah, I'd say that definitely ends up popping up because when people get together for such a long period of time in such close proximity, everyone gets to know each other so well that you do become sort of a, sort of a family that is inseparable. And I definitely have made connections over the past two weeks that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Hazel, mm -hmm. hey, so how did you get involved in youth climate activism? I don't really have a good story about that. I went to my first climate strike mainly because a friend dragged me and then I just contacted Grace and EJ on Instagram. What do you think it was, though, as you look back, that sparked for you that first uh, protest? Yeah, I would also agree with that sentiment that you're part of something much bigger than yourself. Like, in my life, it had just felt so, like, mundane and meaningless. Like, I was just going about doing things completely in my own self-interest. Like doing my schoolwork and it was just going home, doing my chores, going to bed, like it was too routine and I wasn't doing anything that would help anybody, so that was I great. see your friend here, Grace, nodding as you're speaking. <laughs> yeah. Clearly this resonates with you too. 100%. I mean, a couple years ago, school was my life. Like, I was a straight-A student. I was totally focused, like, I have to get good grades, this is my future, this is gonna, what's going to take me through the rest of my life, I'm going to make a lot of money, 
And now I'm just kind of like, it's a second class thing at this point. Like I've missed so much school as you can imagine over the past two weeks. And I've still maintained my grades. I've still maintained everything else. What? And I feel like now that this is so much different, like this is more, I feel like I'm doing more and I feel like I'll have a better future doing this. And I feel like I'm gonna make more connections and end up having a better future with this instead of school. And obviously, education is a priority, but I feel like you can educate yourself in ways other than school. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Now, what do your immediate contemporaries in the classroom there, what do they say to you, Paisley? Honestly, my friends are all just jealous that I'm doing these amazing things and feel so at home and have this sense of belonging that none of them have felt. They, they're all equally passionate about climate justice and indigenous solidarity, but they just don't have the opportunities because their parents are creating these barriers and leading them to believe that it's unsafe to participate in advocating for their own futures. That's really interesting. That's a very interesting point because uh, obviously your parents are supportive of what you're doing. Yeah. Have they been explicit about that? My parents have kind of been in between because they're very open to me going where I feel safe and comfortable, but they don't want to put me in a position that could eventually like jeopardize my future, like getting arrested, which is not one thing that I'm too focused on right now. Um, just because I know that it might have farther implications that I don't know yet. But otherwise, my parents have been pretty supportive. They're all, always willing to drive me wherever I need to be, and they're letting me stay at the legislature for all hours of the night if it's what I want to do. Well, they're providing a lot of support doing yeah. that. How about you, Hazel? Yeah, I've had a similar experience, though I think it can get frustrating for them when I prioritize um, my activism and solidarity um, so highly because they want me to prioritize my school and my education and my family, but I just can't knowing now that there's so much more out there, you can't go back. Do you, either one of you, ever feel that you're missing out on something among your uh, colleagues in the classroom and so forth? Oh, absolutely. I've definitely had a pro problem with not being able to say no, especially when I just got started involved in the movement, because I really wanted to be as involved as possible, and I thought that meant never saying no to anything. So for the first couple months, I was so overwhelmed and so busy because I thought I had to be on every Zoom call, every Slack channel, every committee, everything, where I realized that if you just take a step back and focus on what you really want to do, you can have a much more meaningful impact on the groups you're a part of. It's interesting because now you're nodding. Did the same thing happen <laughs> yeah. to you? Well, I think you really just need to focus and like prioritizing and genuinely just taking some time um, is a super crucial part because I'm sure Grace has experienced this as well. Burnout is oh so common and if you try and do everything, then you just end up not being able to participate whatsoever. Yeah. What about self-care? Because one of the things I've noticed, I've been doing activism for decades, mm -hmm. and uh, people need to take care of themselves. They need to know what they need to do to restore their energy and so forth. So what do you guys do for self-care? I would have to say one of two things. First thing being activism is kind of my self-care because coming from a world where school is prioritized and that should be anyone under 18's only focus in life, it kind of just seems like a nice break from the status quo. And for me, that's self-care, so. Honestly, just sleeping and taking care of my basic necessities because when you're just so like involved and putting your all into a movement, then you don't prioritize like sleeping or showering or brushing your teeth. So even those things, I'm like, wow, this is mind blowing. I could just like do these things regularly. Now you're both young, as I mentioned, you're 14 and you're 13. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like you're not taken seriously by adults? I feel like I'm either taken not enough, not enough or too seriously. Because in some situations I am treated like, oh, you have no power 
you're not going to be able to do anything, you're only 14. And then in some situations, I'm treated like I should be able to do everything a 36 year old does. And to be fair, I have been doing quite a lot, but in some situations that's not exactly appropriate to think that like a 14 year old can do all those responsibilities. Um, mm -hmm. So I've seen it both ways. Yeah, as youth, we're inheriting this climate crisis and we're expected by adults to want to do this work. But the thing is, we're doing it out of obligation. We have no choice if we want futures at all and if we want futures for generations to come and all the inhabitants of the earth. So it's not that, yeah, I would agree, too much responsibility is often pushed onto us, but I think we've risen to the challenge fairly well because we have to. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. It's a real, real consideration, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How does that ever get to you in the, lying in bed at night and thinking, is this really the world that we're heading into? What is wrong? To be honest, I feel like me and Hazel both suffer from something called eco-anxiety. And that's just lying in bed at night, realizing that there's this huge problem that it seems that nobody else cares about, that it seems you're the only one who can change it. And I feel like doing things like going to the legislature and realizing that there's a community around you can kind of help that, as well as just thinking like, what am I supposed to do? Like, is there any more I can do? Which kind of leads into the not being able to say no, because you feel like if you say no, you're not going to be able to make a change. Is there a sense of a countdown for you at 13? A little bit, yeah. I feel like there's an hourglass and the sand is just like running out faster and faster but I f it's really hope like inspiring and hopeful to see all this momentum picking up especially with indigenous solidarity because indigenous solidarity is climate justice and you absolutely can't separate the two issues so honestly just knowing that there's that community there is amazing we're going to end it on that note, which is a very, very strong note. And just a word, you guys are inspiring. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this has been another edition of Citizens Forum. I'm Mark Knight Cannon. Take care.